And now we move to the second speaker, Professor Mubin uh, Rather, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics. He will talk to us about APCs of infection, prevention and control, American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines. Please, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the organizers for inviting us uh, to this meeting. I'm delighted to be here uh, representing the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, and I bring you greetings from uh, our president, Dr. Yasuda, and the uh, board of directors of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, this, this has been a wonderful conference, and we hope that this would be a beginning of a strong and long relationship between the American Academy of Pediatrics and uh, the, pedi the Egyptian pediatricians and the pediatric societies. Um, I was asked to present the uh, guidelines uh, that were published by the American Academy of Pediatrics in uh, uh, 2017, and um, I'm going to uh, try to cover that uh, some of the important points. What I'm going to try to do is really talk about the concepts. There's not enough time uh, to go into detail of infection prevention and control. Uh, you know, cleanliness is half of our faith, and so I think infection prevention and control is all about uh, cleanliness. Uh, what is the most important infection prevention technique uh, and control for, for by show of hands, if you can say it's gloves and gowns, the show of hands. If anybody thinks it's gloves and gowns, please raise your hands. Um, hand hygiene, um, masks, separate sick and well waiting rooms, negative pressure rooms. So I think most people think that it's uh, hand hygiene, and that's correct. Hand hygiene remains and is the most important practice you can do for better uh, infection prevention control uh, in your institutions and your practices. Hand hygiene is something that should be done every time, everywhere. Now, what sort of hand hygiene you use in your practice is totally dependent on the resources you have and the ease of access to these. Alcohol form has become the commonplace practice in many hospitals and private practice in the United States and many parts of the world. It's just the ease of it. You, there's no need of a sink or anything. But soap and water are still probably as, not probably, are as good as uh, uh, alcohol foam. Now, with regard to soap, it is really not necessary anymore, data has shown, to use antibacterial soap. Just regular soap and water is good enough. Now, you can use alcohol foam in most situations, except uh, the, the three situations that are listed there. Clearly, if there's obvious soiling, you should be using uh, soap and water. Now, C. difficile and norovirus are two situations where uh, soap and water is recommended, usually in the outbreak setting, but I would submit to you, it is our practice and recommendation that even without an outbreak setting, if you know that the patient has C. difficile or you suspect that they have C. difficile or uh, norovirus, that you should use soap and water. Uh, again, uh, uh, this is another question. Which of the following is not an acceptable term for infection prevention control procedures? By show of hand, what is not acceptable? Universal precautions, standard precautions, contact precautions, or airborne precautions? Well, it's uh, uh, universal precautions. We don't use the term universal precautions anymore. It has now been replaced with the term standard precautions. The idea being it's a standard of practice. Whether you suspect somebody has an infection or not, you should be using certain precautions all the time, every time. It's critically important that we do that regardless of what we think a patient may or may not have. So let's start with what's the title of my talk, ABCDs of Infection Prevention and Control. I'm going to use IPC uh, throughout the talk as a, an acronym for Infection Prevention and Control. So <clears throat> what are the ABCDs of uh, Infection Prevention and Control? Uh, airborne, which is uh, spread of microorganisms and respiratory secretions by small particles. Body fluids, spread of microorganisms by direct contact. Uh, with blood and body fluids, contact spread by indirect contact by intermediaries such as fomites and hands, droplet spread of microorganisms in respiratory secretions 
by large particles and standard, which is everywhere, every time. Now, I took some literary license here to use some of these uh, terminologies so that we can remember A, B, C, Ds. Probably the better would, would be to start with an S, because the standard precautions form the backbone of any type of infection prevention and control that we do in, any, in our practices. And of course, as I will talk a little bit, some of these uh, uh, ABCDs that I used uh, are really subcategories of the same thing. So, what are the modes of transmission? Is respiratory transmission is the one that probably we face a lot in our, in our everyday practice. And it has to do with airborne, which is airborne and droplets are both respiratory uh, uh, transmissions, except airborne, the spread of microorganisms is uh, by respiratory secretions in smaller particles, as opposed to droplet, which is with the larger particles. Similarly, contact precautions are both, uh, it's really direct and indirect. We use, I use the term blood and body fluids. That's not a traditional term used anymore. It, it used to be used in the past. It's really, uh, both are fall under the category of contact uh, precautions. Uh, if it's a direct contact or indirect contact by intermediaries, then it's contact and body, blood and body fluids after contact or transmission whereby the organisms are in direct or indirect contact. So really the subcategories. So what are standard precautions? I think uh, other than hand hygiene, this is probably one of the most important slides I'm going to show you today. Standard precautions are set of infection and pr control practices that we should be used all the time. And they should be used to prevent transmission of disease even when a possible infection is not suspected. And that's the key thing. Because you always don't know what if a patient has an infection or not. Such, an, such as uh, infection that can be acquired through contact with body fluids. I used to say, and I still say that, if anybody in this room starts bleeding now and I'm asked to help, I'm going to assume that your blood is infected with something bad. You should assume the same thing if I start bleeding. We should have that underlying assumption to be successful in infection prevention and control. And these measures are uh, to be used when providing care for all individuals, whether they uh, appear or not appear to be having symptoms of an infection. So what, what about the respiratory infections that we have? Well, uh, the, the respiratory infections usually spread the bugs by suspension of these drugs in, in air. And for airborne, and I'm giving you a comparison between airborne and, uh, airborne and uh, uh, droplet here, the particles, if they are less than five microns in size, they spread by airborne transmission, and if they are more than five microns, they spread by droplet. And the, the important thing is here is because if the heavier uh, organisms that are uh, uh, more than five microns, they can't go that much farther than three feet, whereas uh, the smaller particles are lighter and they can go larger, they, they can go anywhere between three to six feet and sometimes even longer depending on how the air movement is in a room or a place where you are. And also the lighter particles uh, can remain suspended in the atmosphere in the air for much longer time uh, whereas the uh, heavier organisms will drop and they will not be suspended in the air for that for a longer period of time. Again, that can also vary depending on how the air movement is in your uh, room where you're seeing the patient. So the uh, airborne precautions are used for pathogens, usually viruses such as measles, VZV, and some bacteria also like Mycobacterium tuberculosis, whereas droplet is more with pathogens such as flu viruses, adenoviruses, and bacteria such as Borotella pertussis. So these are, that's why we need to be very careful what type of uh, precaution we use because it, uh, depending on the organism that we suspect. Now this is, oh, remember, I'm going to keep reminding everybody, this is over and above your standard precautions. When you talk about contact precautions, uh, Indirect contact could be with infectious agents and body fluid that may have the organisms. It may, the, uh, the blood and body fluid could be on, a, uh, on, the, on, the, on your bed, on the bed where the patient is, could be on a countertop, could be on your stethoscope where you can transmit that. Whereas directly, if you come direct contact with the blood and body fluid, as, was, as I was mentioning earlier on. Uh, Stool, urine, and discharge from infectious wounds is another one, and you have to be very careful about those. Any draining wound should be dealt with like a, a contact with contact precautions. 
Uh, and usually contact precautions direct bacteria such as MRSA, MRSA, uh, uh, vancomycin-resistant enterococcus, uh, carbapenem-resistant enter, uh, gram-negative enterics, C. difficile, uh, virus such as norovirus, RSV, and influenza can spread by contact precautions. Even though sometimes we think that uh, viruses such as influenza are usually a respiratory isolation, a respiratory transmission, they can also spread by contact precautions. So I think this is extremely important that we remember that. And I, I've listed some of the other things there for direct contact, and of course it's mostly the virus, hepatitis, a B and C virus can by direct contact with the blood, with the body fluids, uh, uh, blood or uh, uh, genital secretions also can result in that. Um, so I want to remind everybody of where I started: hand hygiene. Hand hygiene is very critical once again in your uh, IPC practices and something that we should always focus on. So let's talk about ambulatory. Most of pediatrics is done in your offices, in your clinics. So I'm going to focus a little bit on the ambulatory uh, IPCs. The IPC in the ambulatory setting is really not that different from inpatient setting conceptually. Often the risk is much less, except for respiratory. I think the respiratory isolation, respiratory transmission of infection can occur in your office, whether it is to your uh, staff and yourself or other patients in the waiting room. Again, you start with good hand hygiene. That's key. Good hand hygiene is key. So you should have availability of sinks or alcohol foam, whatever is easier for you, for your patients and your staff. Uh, standard precautions I already mentioned. Now, the AAP in its guidelines does provide certain exceptions to standard precautions that are helpful in you practicing. And it's very important to remember those because that will make your practice easier. And gloves are not uh, needed for changing a diaper or wiping nose of a child who's, who's otherwise healthy, except as a part of required contact precautions. If you know that they have influenza, if you know they have RSV, of course you should wear gloves because contact precautions are, are required. And of course also we have made it easy, gloves are not required when giving immunization uh, to, your, to, your, to your patients. That's something uh, we still see sometimes practices do, but it's really not necessary. You should have available in your practices uh, personal protective equipment, gowns, gloves, masks, etc., uh, especially in the respiratory season in the winter when the, there's a large number of uh, children uh, with respiratory viral infections. I think this last statement is very important, whether it's in, the, in your office or is it in, your, uh, in the hospital. If you are not sure, assume that there's infection and isolate. The example we, so what we do, for ex the two examples we give often in the United States are influenza, I'm sorry, pertussis and uh, TB. Uh, if we don't isolate these patients and they end up having uh, one, one of those infections, it takes us a lot of, re it takes for us a lot of resources, time and effort uh, to investigate all the contacts and provide the appropriate Profile access when necessary. So, but they can, this can be true for many other situations. So you don't expose your patients and your staff unnecessarily for potential infections. So, what are some of the special conditions where you need special infection prevention and control uh, practices? Cystic fibrosis, HIV/AIDS, sickle cell disease, or Kawasaki disease. Well, it's cystic fibrosis. Now, I know cystic fibrosis is not very common uh, except in the, uh, other than the Caucasian population, but I know we have patients of cystic fibrosis. Uh, I know we have them in Pakistan. I'm sure you also have some in Egypt uh, because, uh, you know, over, over the millennia, these genes have uh, transferred from place. And, uh, of course, Alexander passed through uh, Egypt, and he also passed through Pakistan. So he left a few genes for us there. Uh, one of my classmates from, from uh, uh, elementary school has uh, sickle cell disease. And the poor guy got everything out from his body because he used to get abdominal crisis. And we did not diagnose it until we were in medical school. And he came to visit us and had another abdominal crisis. And our hematology professor diagnosed sickle cell disease by looking at the slide. So who would think that uh, somebody in Pakistan would have sickle cell disease? But he is from the northwest province of Pakistan. A uh, place called Miransha, where is where Alexander passed through there. So, um, and in retrospect, he's very fair, has blonde, light blonde hair, blue eyes, uh, 
So he has certainly more than just uh, sickle cell uh, uh, disease. Because remember, Mediterranean, uh, the sickle cell disease in the Mediterranean area also. Uh, patients with cystic fibrosis is a special group. Uh, they are at risk for infection to themselves, but they are also placing other people at risk because they have resistant, they carry colonized by resistant organisms. We generally follow the CDC guidelines, specifically contact precautions for healthcare personnel. We should put masks on patients with cystic fibrosis as soon as they enter the healthcare facility. And the minimum distance between a CF patient and other patients recommended is six feet. It is three feet for all other patients, but for those with cystic fibrosis, the recommendation is six feet. Not easy to do, but certainly that's the recommendation. And that's why we always say if your cystic fibrosis patient comes to your practice or is admitted to the hospital, they should be taken straight to a room so their risk for transmission or exposure to others is much less. We also recommend uh, uh, through the uh, Academy enhanced precautions during the influenza season, which in the United States is October 1st to March 31st, but I can tell you for the last several years it has been extended. Um, we are still in enhanced precautions and where I practice, uh, you, but that's sometimes that you, something you have to follow in your uh, own situation. Um, other special circumstances are uh, situation when you are concerned about, about many of the disease listed there, Ebola, MERS, SARS, bird, bird flu. Um, we have recently had a lot of issues with measles in the uh, United States. There's an outbreak of measles going on. And uh, we don't see measles as much as we see in other parts of the world. Uh, we had one, we had two cases in Jacksonville. I can tell you, it, it got the whole system quite unruffled, uh, uh, ruffled because of it, that had not been seen for a long time. Of course, we, everybody remembers what happened with swine flu, and if you have pandemic flu, uh, you will also have enhanced precautions. I think communication in seasonal uh, uh, increases outbreaks and emergency infection is critical. I think you can follow some standard practices when you have seasonal, uh, like influenza and RSV, you should have those enhanced precautions uh, those periods of time. If there's an outbreak in your community, pay special attention to that so you can put uh, uh, some enhanced precautions. A risk assessment should be done at triage and at, uh, when the patient is calling in. In our practice, when we had lots of uh, influenza cases, and now even the chicken poxers, we don't see that much, we, are, we really prefer patients not to come to the hospital or to the clinic unless they are so critically ill. And I know, at least in the United States, some of these evaluations are done in the parking garage, so um, in the parking lot, so the patient does not expose other patients. I'm going to, I have very, I've got less than five minutes left, so I'm going to go a little faster. I'm going to skip this just to tell you hand hygiene is so important. Um, if you take anything from this lecture today, is, it's hand hygiene. Uh, some other consideration, design your, your facilities, isolation room. It is all, all a resource-related issue, I, the, but this is what we recommend in the American Academy of Pediatric Guidelines. Housekeeping is very important, how you clean. Uh, your offices, sterilization when needed, safer sharps, do not recap. That's one of the most common reasons people get uh, needle sticks is when they try to recap a needle. Um, sharps containers are very important. You should have easily available sharps containers and safer disposal of medical waste. Then policies and trainings, how you train your staff. I think this is an ongoing thing. You should you know, have reminders. You can put those WHO posters which tell you about the five uh, type of times when you can do hand hygiene. Um, they, are, they are available. You can print them off the WHO website. I'm going to quickly talk about another thing that you often may not think as a part of infection prevention and control is the de-escalation of antibiotics used because if more antibiotics we use, the more likelihood we are going to have resistant organisms. So discontinue antibiotics as soon as you can. Change the route of administration from intravenous to oral whenever you can. Reduce the number of antibiotics whenever you can and use the narrow spectrum antibiotics whenever you can. Remember the six Ds of outpatient stewardship, diagnosis, Make sure you have the right diagnosis, an appropriate diagnosis. Make sure you're using the right drug based on some of the suggestions I made earlier. Duration should be as short as possible. Uh, De-escalation, meaning you narrow the spectrum whenever possible. Discontinue whenever possible. And of course, decrease the, uh, the, both the use and time of antibiotic and the dose also when necessary. And this is, we have all been there, I call it darkness. 
It's an acronym, diagnosing an antibacterial requiring condition not otherwise seen. What I mean by that is, and we are among pediatrician friends, we have all looked in the ear of a child who has probably has a viral infection and convinced ourselves this is otitis media and prescribed them an antibiotic when it was not really necessary. So avoid darkness. Again, hand hygiene, if you haven't gotten the message, hand hygiene is very important. I'm going to go through this very quickly. These are the ABCDs. A is for airborne, B for body fluids, C is for contact, D for droplet. I already went through that. E is for environmental hygiene. That's when you talk about the cleaning up of the equip equipment, cleaning up of the, uh, your offices, and the flow of air, how the air passes through your office is very important because it can not only spread the in infection farther, but it can also increase the time for suspension of the respiratory organisms. Gloves, gowns, and goggles in an appropriate situation are very critical. Again, I keep on coming back to hand hygiene, uh, alcohol-based or soap water before and after wearing gloves. It's very important. People often will use uh, uh, hand hygiene before uh, wearing gloves, but will not use hand hygiene after taking the gloves off. Don't forget, hand hy um, gloves can have micropunctures, and the organisms are small enough that they can pass through that. Isolation procedures to be followed. It's a job number one for everyone. I think it's a very important for us to keep our patients healthy and our staff and ourselves protected that we have that. And you are going to be the kings and queens of infection prevention control. Only you can do it. It's nobody else's responsibility but yours. You need to show leadership in that. You as the healthcare provider, as a physician, you have to be a leader in your practice, in your hospital, in your office, who's going to make sure you follow the rules, and so does everybody else. Mask, which should be properly fitting. I've seen people have wearing masks and it's coming under the nose. It doesn't really help if your mask is under your nose. Uh, no one is exempt from infection IPC procedures. And I can tell you, whenever I'm making rounds and somebody will see and they will try to remind me that did you wash your hands or did hand hygiene, and I usually do it and actually when I do it, I keep on wringing my hands so they can see me, but when they do that, I don't get upset. I thank them for reminding me and will often do it again so that they don't feel like that they have done something wrong, even if I've done hygiene. And we have to lead by example on that. Offer reminders to each other, personal protective equipment, quality parameters should be measured and shared with staff if you are showing improvement. So and I was giving this talk in Pakistan several years ago, and somebody asked, a young doctor said, we don't have all these resources. You live in America. So I said, you can do something very simple. I was talking, I think oh, it was a breakfast this morning with uh, uh, Bill and Arrow. So I basically told them, this is what you should do. The soap you have in your unit, this was in the hospital. See how much soap you are using. Establish a standard. If you are using less soap, that means people are not following hand hygiene. If you are using more soap, it's a very simple measure. It doesn't, very, doesn't cost much. So I think that's something we did. I think my time is almost over. So I'm just going to say that uh, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm, as I said, I'm an infectious disease specialist. I'm a hospital epidemiologist for my children's hospital for the last 30 years. Uh, I live and breathe this, so I think it is one of the most important things that we can do to protect ourselves and our patients. And something, um, the best thing you can do with IPC is that you never have a problem. So you, you will never have the cost that goes along with it. Thank you very much for your attention and delighted to answer any questions.